Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our lecture tonight. So welcome to those here and those streaming as well online. So tonight, our topic is um, why do people go to church at Easter, which is uh, very topical with Easter coming up um, and to be given by a brother Sly. So uh, if you all stand, we'll open this uh, night together with prayer. Dear Lord God, we come before you at this time to ask your blessing on this time together and ask that you give us humble hearts to open our hearts to learn from your word and to take in the lessons that you have recorded for us. And Lord, please help us to understand why we do things and um, please help us to um, commit to you and to um, to know the reason behind the things that we do and if and to realign our lives better with with you Lord we know that you control all things in this world and we see lots of things happening in the world overseas and even here in Australia and our, in our own um, city. So please help us to see your plan for this world and for our lives and to see that there is a meaning in everything that, that happens around us. So Lord, we ask your blessing on tonight that you will help us concentrate on you and your word and to gain a greater understanding of of um, uh, these historic events from from old times that even the world today who know nothing about you still celebrate um, and even though they don't know what they're celebrating so please help us to understand these things better and to gain a better knowledge of you so we leave this night in your care through Jesus Christ's name, amen. So to introduce our th thoughts tonight, um, we've got a reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 47, and Brother Jude is going to read that for us. Reading with you all, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to the end. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer mine holy one, thine holy one, to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with, him, with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. 
This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, Yahweh said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptised, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the ecclesia daily such as should be saved. Thanks, Judah, for that reading and um, look forward to how this reading relates to Easter eggs and Easter bunnies. So thanks, Brother Sly. Thank you, uh, Brother Peter. And uh, good evening, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, young people, uh, friends, um, to our gospel address tonight, as our brother chairman has mentioned. It's on a very uh, interesting topic, a uh, very topical uh, topic as well. Uh, I guess uh, <coughs> uh, we're searching for an answer tonight, <laughs> and I believe as most of you probably know the answer, the question of why do people go to church at Easter? And a uh, timely question, um, and uh, as, as brother Peter said, and as I know from my own experience, having grown up uh, in the Methodist church, uh, it's a whole week of, uh, of, of, of activity today, actually is the, what they call the Palm Sunday, uh, where <clears throat> it sort of commemorates the uh, uh, entering into Jerusalem of uh, the Lord Jesus as the churches uh, claim, and uh, how that um, was a very joyous occasion. And uh, later on, a week later, uh, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ on uh, Easter Day. So tonight, uh, dear friends, um, it's a, a mix of uh, looking at what the uh, general churches um, uh, have uh, been able over many centuries, hundreds of years, to convince uh, the whole of Christendom and the um, whole of society uh, of uh, what Easter looks like and uh, what it's based on. And tonight we'll be trying to uh, uh, sort of uh, sift through uh, some of those things and try and understand why people that are well-intended um, so to speak, do try and drag themselves to church uh, at Easter, and uh, why is that the case? And uh, as Brother Peter uh, sort of highlighted, accepted to our reading tonight, we'll try and uh, round it up with uh, some real lessons from the teachings of Scripture concerning this whole thing uh, which supposedly Easter is built around, and that is the death the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll try and um, uh, get some uh, takeaway uh, lessons uh, at the end of that. And it's a beautiful reading, Acts chapter 2, as you uh, all know, uh, one of the very first messages 
that the uh, disciples, or later the apostles, uh, were commissioned to take into all the world, beginning from uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and to all the world, the message of the resurrection of uh, the Lord Jesus. So we'll um, uh, touch on that uh, tonight. Uh, by way of agenda, <coughs> we um, simply, uh, is how we'll go through with our discussions tonight, um, obviously about Easter, and then looking at Acts chapter 2 and try and draw some conclusions. So, in, in terms of uh, introduction, um, dear uh, friends, um, I guess in answering the question of why do people go to church at Easter, it probably opens up a few more questions. Um, for example, why go to church at all? Um, and um, I know from my own experience that uh, Easter somehow uh, brings about a sense of, you know, a fervor to uh, take yourself to church. And um, <clears throat> um, I guess it's tied up with the understanding, the basic understanding that God's son uh, came, died, so there's a sense of guilt, there's a sense of uh, wanting to start afresh, I guess. And for a teenager like myself who had just enough understanding, uh, enough uh, spirituality, that also struck me. And uh, I, um, yeah, so Easter was sort of to a Christian um, a, a good time to probably start going to church. But whether you're Christian or a non-Christian, I think you'd agree with me, dear friends, that there is an inherent desire in everybody, whether you're Christian or not a Christian, to try and reach out for a uh, deity or a supreme being somewhere out there. Um, and, uh, you know, the evidence of that just put up a snip. There's so many different faiths that we have today. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, they... Um, <clears throat> They are fates that have uh, existed from uh, long before. And it's all to do with the, the, the desire to do something right to, uh, in terms of this great being, this deity. And the fates of today reflect that. And not only today, it's actually over many past generations, whether they were the, you know, the old religions or the new religions, pagan worships, ancestor worships, whether it was a monotheistic god or pantheons of gods, Gods of the unknown world, God of the underworld, etc., uh, as it was way back then, um, it continues on to, to, to our days. And um, I guess the desire to go to church sort of connects to that desire for people to make right um, with their deity or their God. And so it is with Christians. Now, why do this on Easter? And uh, is Easter really just one particular day? And uh, when I was growing up, it was actually a ongoing, almost like a festival of a week. And uh, the Catholic Church, I think they um, had some other um, milestones fitted in there, like the Lent, Ash Wednesday, uh, etc. Uh, why has it become such? And is it a Friday? Why do they call it Good Friday? or Saturday, or Sunday, or Monday, to coincide with the public holidays. What is this, the origin of, of, of Easter? Now, some of the things that we know, as I've shared earlier at, uh, <clears throat> in brief, Easter is believed to be sacred, a religious day. There's that one time in the year, maybe, compared to all other times where you really feel quite humbled, where you really feel quite exposed, um, and um, you want to do something right. You want to make a fresh start. Um, and, and um, you know, you ask any Christian, it's a very sacred day in the year. And it comes uh, once a year, um, and um, Christians believe um, from the point of view of the Bible, that it's got uh, a connection to the resurrection from the dead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said earlier, there's a deep sense of guilt, sadness, and um, a good time to start all over again. And it's part of family tradition, where the whole family gets together. Um, and I remember with my mum, it was quite a big deal 
uh, best things come out, best map rolled out, uh, etc. And uh, yeah, very, very special time, not just individual, but just a family. And um, yeah, and uh, somehow, as I mentioned in the, uh, in the slides, all this was given its, uh, I guess, its, its, um, its powerful backing with all authority uh, way, way back uh, about 17, 1800 years ago in 325 AD by the, the church, the Council of Churches. We'll touch on that a little bit more uh, in more detail. <clears throat> and that church mechanism or church hierarchy that created all that uh, and has evolved, evolved over many generations to the point of what it is today. It's a, it's, it's a, um, <coughs> it's, it's a big um, organization of activities and so forth. Are they scriptural? And that's the question we're trying to answer tonight. What's the fuss over so much on that one day? Where, where, where is the backing in, in scripture? Uh, today, for example, you have uh, coming up to Easter, uh, as I said, there's, there's the Ash Wednesday where Catholics celebrate, and then on the actual Good Friday as um, uh, a dawn service, and then on Sunday morning as well, uh, dawn service, um, where, where people flock to church and um, uh, yeah, receive uh, the blessings from their priest, uh, priests, uh, etc., and um, made to feel good. It's a sacrifice they've done rising up early in the morning, and, uh, um, um, and, and that's it uh, for the day. It, it, it gives a sense of really good uh, achievement. So what's special about Easter? Obviously, a few reasons that uh, put up there, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Christians see it as a joyous holiday, uh, representing the revealing of God's plan of salvation for all of mankind. Um, a plan to save um, all humanity. Commemorates, as you said, the resurrection of Jesus, his rising from the dead. And then there's the traditions and customs that come with it. Uh, you recognize the first two dot points. They are linked to what the Bible teach. Uh, but then there's um, yeah, some traditions that come along uh, with that, and we'll touch on a few of those later. But one that I put up here is that Christian tradition hold that Jesus came to take away the sins of the whole world. He paid the price uh, by his death, and um, it's created something good for everybody. He didn't have to die, but he died as our replacement, uh, which adds to the guilt and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the desire to make right. Um, the tradition of the churches, uh, are they consistent with the teaching of the Bible? Uh, they're not, because uh, Jesus has clearly mentioned through the writings of uh, the Apostle Paul and uh, etc., and the teachings of Jesus himself, um, he came uh, as a representative of you and I. Uh, he came in our nature. In the fullness of time, uh, God sent his son, made of a woman, made under the law, just like you and me, uh, flesh and blood, and uh, so the churches, um, yeah, they, they, they have uh, est established this, uh, this uh, big um, tradition and custom revolves about making people feel more guilty and more accountable um, uh, to, um, I guess, to the teachings of the church. So the, <clears throat> the origin of the word Easter, the word itself, um, in terms of the Bible, it's interesting. It's actually mentioned in the Bible uh, in Acts chapter 12, uh, verse 4. And it's quite curious also because that's the only time where the translators, and in this case, uh, the historical records trace it back to William Tyndale, a person that we uh, you know, hold uh, quite a lot of esteem for. Um, he, uh, in his translation, the of the Greek and the Hebrew into English, and then uh, Coverdale also picked it up, and um, just this one occasion, he chose to use the word Easter, uh, for whatever reason, only known to him, um, and Coverdale, um, yeah, compared to 
all other passages um, where he's used the correct uh, Greek translation, the, the, the Passover. And um, they were the Passover um, or Easter, as mentioned in Acts 12 verse 4, is uh, related to Passover as a meal, Passover as a feast, or Passover as a day. And it's uh, also the same meaning in the original Hebrew uh, where um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the practice of the Passover feast was first instigated in the olden day times. Olden Testament times, sorry. And um, we, um, this is an extract from William Tyndale's translation and uh, with all its uh, yeah, unusual spelling as we would uh, uh, see it today. Um, he uh, definitely um, had um, uh, coined the word Easter, but he was writing in uh, 1535, okay. many, many years after the, uh, uh, the church had approved that the Easter be uh, uh, kept as a, uh, as a religious holiday throughout all Christendom. And uh, as I said there, that there's no other place in the New Testament where the English translation of Easter uh, is, is used. But nonetheless, it's become a, uh, a revered day, a holy day for all of uh, Christendom. And it's unlike the early Christian believers of the first century who held faithful to the teachings of Jesus himself and who formed the initial church or the ecclesia, as the Bible calls it, just an assembly, a group, uh, a gathering of those of uh, like faith. They were the original church and they never kept anything that has the form and resemblance of uh, Easter, let alone as we know it today. They had some traditions, as they call it in scripture, uh, which we will touch on a little bit later. Uh, for example, meeting weekly uh, to break bread, but there was no such thing as, uh, uh, as Easter. So just a, a little bit more information on Easter. Uh, the, um, as we said, the authority of the church uh, established uh, this in uh, 325 AD. But um, sadly, the gradual, um, I guess, development of Easter um, had already started well before, and I say sadly because it came as a result of the the, the persecution the, of the Jews um, in their own homeland uh, by a Roman emperor called Hadrian, uh, Emperor Hadrian around 132-135, where he crushed a rebellion and he brought about a new policy where he says we're going to squash out everything to do with Jewish, um, uh, Jewish belief, uh, Jewish festivals, and um, and he flipped it over by saying the church is going to take over from now and um, we build um, cathedrals and all that in the Holy Land and uh, dictating its terms from Rome and uh, yeah, hence started the, I guess, the, 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 the motion, the movement to uh, corrupt Christianity and to eventually bring about what we are talking about tonight, uh, which is Easter. So by 325 AD, um, it became a rubber stamped by the Council of the Churches and uh, promulgated throughout all the whole world. And um, uh, as we said earlier, the wheels had started to turn from as early as 200 years before uh, through the Roman Emperor Hadrian. So, as a result of what Hadrian did, the new leaders of the church, as I said, uh, uh, from Rome, and this is uh, recorded by Eusebius, for example, one of the historians in the church history, he said the new leaders of the church changed the traditional date of the Christian Passover, for example, because they were squashing out everything to do with the Jewish, the Mosaic law, and even the Christian believers, the early believers, they were persecuted and driven out um, and um, uh, it goes on to say that um, there was an, an example. It got changed from Nissan, 
or the month of Abib, the 14th, uh, Passover was changed to a, a Sunday. Uh, so no matter whatever day in the year, uh, Passover would fall um, according to the Jewish calendar. He made the proclamation that it's going to be a Sunday. Easter is going to be a Sunday um, in order to separate and distance himself from the Jewish and the Jewish Christians. And so diminished the, uh, the Jewish Christians and um, the Jewish and uh, the power of the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, what they call the Gentile Christians started to increase with the uh, influence of the Roman church uh, in Rome. And so as a result, uh, uh, the, the biblical symbols and ceremonies of Passover, for example, they were replaced with pagan symbols uh, and myths. Uh, the, instead of the Passover lamb, uh, came in the Easter bunny uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, Passover became Easter, uh, which derives its uh, name from uh, Eostra or Eostra or Eostra or Ostra. That's uh, a whole lot of pagan goddesses if you're interested. Um, And so in 325 AD, the Council of Churches determined that there's going to be a, uh, a fixed time that will be calculated, and uh, there'll be two things we'll achieve uh, out of this, and that is uh, we're going to cut off all connection to Jewish uh, um, laws and customs, the Mosaic law, and two, we're going to uh, create a time that is universal, that can be uh, yeah, um, uh, proclaimed to all of Christendom. And so in 325 AD, um, they decided it was going to be the first Sunday from the first full moon after this spring equinox, which is around March 21st. So it's going to be, a, I guess, a, a combination of solar and lunar sort of calendar um, uh, calculation uh, where the, the faces of the moon in terms of also the, the, uh, the location of the sun. And um, uh, interestingly, here we are in the southern hemisphere, but a lot of things that surround Easter had to do with the Northern Hemisphere, the spring, the spring festival, uh, when winter uh, ended and the spring came and so uh, the pagan uh, connection to all the festivals of spring were very much um, uh, what was um, kept in mind when all these um, uh, new um, arrangements with Easter uh, came into existence. I guess um, yeah, a lot of sources, reliable sources, Wikipedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, and a few other uh, websites, for example, ancientorigins.net. Uh, the English word Easter it parallels the German word Ostend, uh, onset and origin, and it's likely to uh, derive from the um, uh, it's a, a Christian designation of uh, Easter week, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's not just one day. They've made it into such a big arrangement of it's a whole week. Um, and um, it um, comes from the Latin phrase, uh, alba, or oh, sorry, albis, um, connected to the uh, Latin idea of dawn and um, became uh, esterum in the old German language. So it's to do with east or the rising of the sun from the dawn, and it's related to spring when the night is shortening and the day is lengthening, and hence the pagan um, festivals that revolved around all these goddesses uh, to do with uh, Easter. The rejoicing of the people, that spring is here, and so on and so forth, and the symbols of fertility and uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, re re renewed life all comes into play. Um, of course, we've heard that it's also related to the story of a, a, a goddess that uh, goes all the way back to Babylon, who, whose name just happens to be Ishtar. And also, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, the goddesses of spring, uh, Yostra, Ostara, or Ostra, that Ostra word means to the east, so Australia <laughs> is to the east. Uh, so th those words that connects to the idea of the dawning from the east 
the lengthening of the day. Um, um, and so all these pagan connections uh, embraced by the Christian churches um, and uh, rubber stamped and rolled out to the whole of Christendom. And, um, and here we are today, um, another year in the Easter rolls by. Just put it at the bottom there, the analyst of the word uh, suggests that the origin of the word Easter, I agree that it was named after Easter, an ancient word meaning spring. So spring, dawn, uh, a whole lot of things that uh, <coughs> are, are connected. Of course, you, it's not supper time yet, but uh, you probably see pictures of this, that's woolies and so on and so forth there. Um, what do these customs that we've come to, uh, or the whole world has come to associate with Easter? Just out of interest, uh, you know, for our interest uh, tonight, uh, dear friends, just to make the point that a religious uh, sacred day, or as the Christian world, has got so many uh, tentacles uh, reaching out to um, pagan origins, uh, sadly. And so this is the customs that we have here, the hot cross bun, the bunny rabbits, the eggs, um, and even the American president, he has his uh, annual White House Easter egg roll. Did you know that? Uh, so it's a, a custom that uh, the American president presides over. They get all the families and children, they you got a book in, and they have the uh, Easter, Easter egg roll on the lawns of the White House, uh, something that started from the 1878 by um, <coughs> the President Rutherford Hayes, and it continues to today. But um, uh, just very quickly, I want to start this uh, comment here. A, a very uh, uh, notable comment by Socrates, a very famous, uh, um, I guess, uh, Greek um, philosopher. Uh, he made this comment here that um, the observance of Easter by the church is really just a perpetuation of pre-Christian custom. And you, it makes you wonder, why would they need to perpetuate pre-Christian custom? And uh, I think the, the, the answer, as you, you know as much as I do, would have to do, because, uh, had to do with the fact that they wanted okay, to hold the loyalty of everybody that has come under the umbrella of Christianity, of Christendom. So a completely different approach to what the Lord Jesus Christ had instigated. You know, those that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so this was a, a, a deliberate attempt to ensure the numbers, even if you have to bring in pre-Christian customs, pagan customs, and so on. So this was Socrates that made that comment, and he goes on to say, just as many other customs have been established, and stating that neither Jesus nor his apostles enjoined and the keeping of this or any other festival. This is specifically about the festival of Easter, which has been around, uh, as we said, since uh, 325 AD officially, and here is Socrates um, in 380, uh, between 384, 39 AD. So here we go, the, uh, in terms of this customs, the wildly practiced customs on Easter Sunday that relate to the symbol of the rabbit or the Easter bunny and the egg. The hare or um, rabbit was a symbol associated with Eostra that we saw earlier that um, the goddess of the spring, representing the beginning of springtime. Uh, likewise, the egg has come to represent spring, fertility and uh, renewal. In Germanic mythology it said that Ostara, uh, she healed a wounded bird that she found in the woods by changing it into a, a hare, from a bird to a rabbit, uh, through her power, according to the mythology. And so still partially a bird, the hare, the rabbit, showed its gratitude to the goddess by laying eggs as gifts. And the... Um, and Cyclopaedia Britannica says the egg is a symbol of fertility and renewed life. It goes back to ancient Egyptians and Persians. who Also, I uh, had the custom of coloring and eating eggs during their spring festival. 
and in ancient Egypt, an egg, an egg symbolized the sun, while for the Babylonians, the egg represents the hatching of the Venus Ishtar, who fell from heaven to the Euphrates. It goes on and on. Um, hot, hot cross buns, the pagan Saxons uh, would bake cross buns at the beginning of spring in honor of the goddess Eostre, which is widely believed to be the origin of the name Easter. Cross was a symbol of the rebirth of the world after winter, and the four quarters on your hot cross bun, it represents the four seasons. The Christians saw the cross shape and they adopted the baked good as a symbol of the resurrection of Christ who died on a cross. And the first recorded reference for hot cross bun <coughs> Um, was in, um, I'm not quite sure what this is, but it's a poor robin, it looks like a, a nursery rhyme, poor robin's almanac, early 1700s, uh, which goes, Good Friday comes this month, the old woman runs with one or two a penny hot cross buns. And of course we all know, dear friends, that although considered a religious-based holiday, Easter, uh, secular businesses, uh, thrived, don't they? They have a stake in promoting the continuation and the observance of Easter. And um, you can just use your imagination as to you know, how, how they've benefited. Um, now reading tonight, uh, dear friends, in Acts chapter 2, just um, sort of finish up on some take-home lessons. Now the clear message right from the early beginning of the community of believers, or the, um, of Jesus Christ, or the early Christians, it always had to do with the message of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And connected to that was the promise that God would give life, and salvation uh, to everyone that comes to believe in Jesus and his resurrection. And the disciples, the apostles, they were going to be witnesses of this fact, as Peter was doing in the story that we read in Acts chapter 2. We know that the time that Peter was standing up here and addressing the men of Israel, hear these words, this was 50 days from the time of Jesus' death. It was on the Jewish day of Pentecost which is 50 days from the Feast of Passover. And the Apostle Peter was preaching to the men and women that had gathered in Jerusalem uh, to keep that particular feast. It was a feast of harvest, or in gathering, according to the, the law of Moses. It was seven weeks from the day of Passover, or 50 days. And this particular event here, Tracing back the time, it has been, um, as you said, six weeks since the death of Jesus. It's believed that Jesus died on the day of Passover. And he had been raised from the dead three days later. We know that. And then it continued in person with his disciples, as recorded for us in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, for another 40 days before he ascended to heaven. Recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9. And so now it was another week after that, and here we are on the 50th day since his death. And Jesus had promised the disciples in that last conversation in Acts chapter 1, of verse 8, of a significant event that will occur, an event that will also mark the commencement of their work as apostles to preach the message of the resurrected Savior of the world and to bring about repentance in those that will believe him and be saved. The points that we read from the reading uh, tonight, and I'll just go through them, and uh, when we're pondering the meaning of Easter. Fair enough, people go to church on Easter. What really is the message of Easter? The message of Easter has to do with this man of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God. 
a man that has this stamp and the approval, not of the churches, but by the great God himself, the God of heaven and earth, a stamp of approval through miracles, wonders, and signs that he performed on God's behalf. And that was in our reading, Acts chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 22, if you've got that in front of you. So it starts and ends with this man that was approved by God. And this man was foretold by the prophets that he will suffer, he will die, and the fact that God had already planned all that. There was no other way. This was going to be it. In verse 23, the prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Zechariah, and David, the man himself, in his Psalms, for example, Psalm 16. It was necessary that Jesus should die as representative of mortal men. You may, we won't turn to it, but you may want to write down these references. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, 21, and Hebrews 2, verse 14 to 18. It was necessary that Jesus should die not as a substitute, as the churches would have you believe, and therefore feel guilty, and so on and so forth. But he died as a representative of mortal men. But he was sinless, and that was the point of our reading today, wasn't it? Because he was sinless. In verse 24, God set him free from death and raised him to life. And the reason given in verse 24 is that death could not hold him in its power. So it's a cause of rejoicing, the victory that God has won. And verse 25 to verse 31, and here Peter, standing in the day of Pentecost and speaking, he cites from, as I said, David's Psalms 16, verse 8 to 11, where the David, as mentioned here by Peter, him himself, verse 30, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, and here, David, assuming the role of a prophet in Psalm 16, he foretold of this wonderful endorsement of God, the vindication of the man approved by God, who would die, but undeserving of the natural occurrences of corruption in the grave that happens to you and I when we die. This man does not deserve that, and God freed him from death. And for three days, he was in the grave, as we know from the story. And the celebration of Easter has to do about this fact that he was raised from the dead. And this man who David called his Lord, someone who was higher ranking than David the king, he called this man his Lord, and he said he'd be raised to life not to see corruption. And clearly the man he was speaking of was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now just as an aside, I counted up that this section of the Bible that we read about, uh, dear br uh, brothers and sisters, young people, friends, clearly has the underlying theme of the resurrection. Either directly or indirectly, it's mentioned about seven times. And it's right there in this section. Verse 24, verse 27, verse 30, verse 31, verse 32, verse 34, verse 36. There's clearly the message about this man who is not going to see corruption, who will be raised from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ destined to be king over David's throne when it is restored. Verse 30. So all these wonderful things about this man that are connected to the reason that he had to rise again is the fact that he will, he has a job to do still in the future, and that is to sit as king over all the earth, over the throne, the restored throne of his father David. 
and verse 32 to verse 35. In the meantime, he has ascended to heaven. Exalted, given all glory and all authority, all power and all authority, and seated at the right hand of God, awaiting his return to this earth to set up God's kingdom. And that's citing another psalm, Psalm 110. And verse 36, as Peter concludes his comments, he starts off by saying, back in verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words, and they have heard the words. Because when we come to verse 36, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord, or supreme authority, and Christ, or the anointed Messiah, the Savior. And the people did hear, because verse 37 says, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they commented what they commented to Peter. And such was the reaction of the people in these days. And brothers and sisters, young people, and dear friends, the message of Easter is clearly spelt out in all of scriptures, not just this section here. And the re result of that is the reaction that we read here in verse 37. And the reply of Peter in verse 38. What shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus opened up the way to salvation. Just opened up. Didn't quite get them to salvation. Just opened up the way. And according to verse 40, part of the gift of God was... It, this call and this offer was going to go to as many as the Lord shall call. And their calling was to result in them being saved. Verse 40 and verse 47. And so, if you like, that's the process, isn't it, dear friends? The process that we have read will involve receiving the word of God, the gospel, verse 22 to 36 followed by, verse 38, a repentance or humbling of oneself to acknowledge our helplessness without Jesus and a desire to change our lives. And then finally, they've been baptized. That's what Peter said they ought to do. Then verse 38. So it's not the process that I <laughs> used to believe, of just going to church once in a year during Easter and uh, start afresh and again and again the process is clearly spelled that there has to be a receiving of the words as like this day Peter was giving to them to the men of Israel in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost so receiving of the words of God and the repentance and followed by baptism into the saving name of Jesus that was the last instruction Jesus gave to his disciples And it's recorded in Mark 16, for example, was 15 to 16. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believes not shall be condemned. And the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, the Jew, the Gentile, for in it is revealed the righteousness of God, faith to faith. And it's, and it's basic, dear friends, it's not sophisticated. You don't need Rome to dictate the terms of it. It's there in the Bible in front of us. You know, the section we read ends in a, a, a really a nice picture of this growing number of believers. And by the way, uh, 3,000 of them were baptized on this particular day as we read there in verse 41. But this growing number of believers, of Jesus, in this first century group of believers, they had this simple practice of continuing together, 
steadfastly in the doctrines of the apostle, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. I'm reading that from verse 42, if you've noticed. And again, verse 47, praising God and the Lord adding to the ecclesia daily such as should be saved. So obviously there's a need to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. His life, his death, and his resurrection, the simplicity of how the Bible tells you and me it ought to be done. We don't need Easter bunnies or chocolate eggs. We can remember the Lord Jesus as it was originally intended in all its simplicity and its clearness here in the reading, for example, of Acts chapter 2. Certainly not just once a year. It must be regular and with fellow believers. No need for big festivity. A simple meal, fellowship, a breaking of bread, not necessarily just in the church, and it even, can even be from house to house, as was the practice here by the um, early believers in verse 46, breaking of bread from house to house, eating with gladness, singleness of heart. And Acts chapter 20, verse 7, in expanding that custom, it specified that it was on the first day of the week that they did it, or on a Sunday, as we would gather to remember the Lord Jesus Christ in the bread and the wine. That's clearly spelt out, the, 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 the actual commemoration of the Lord as they gather together in fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers was on the first day of the week. So really, in closing, the remembering and the following of Jesus as his disciples is in fact even more regular than weekly. So we've come down from Easter being just a big annual festival and everyone feels very pious. Everyone feels really having a good go at the next 12 months. It's come down to a weekly remembrance of our Lord and even daily. Luke 9 verse 23. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. And so in the spirit of what we've talked about, brothers and sisters, young people and dear friends, that uh, the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ is a commitment that even means daily. It's not annual for sure. It even means daily. So in conclusion, it is celebrated by Christians because it, to them it represents a fulfillment of the prophecies, the revelation of God's plan of salvation for all mankind. It claims to commemorate Jesus' resurrection. It claims to celebrate the defeat of death and hope of salvation. As we've attempted to point out today, if we put aside the tradition of Christianity and how sadly Christian churches have mixed the biblical teaching with pagan customs, if we just focus on the Bible itself and its clear teaching, the belief of the early Christian community about the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will find the pure, uncorrupted, and simple reasons for Christ's death and his resurrection. The requirements for this is simple, it's uncompromising and can only be found by sincere, unbiased, and prayerful reading of God's Bible. The Christadelphians are more than happy to assist you in this journey of discovery and see us today. Thank you. on um, well, your behalf I'd like to thank our brother Sly for that um, enlightening talk on the origins of uh, Easter and, and um, the true meaning of, 
of Christ's sacrifice for us. So now next week, um, there's actually no lecture here um, due to a lot of people being away. Um, so, but I believe the week in a fortnight's time there will be a lecture here. So, so if you all rise, we'll now um, close in prayer and give thanks for supper. <coughs> Dear Lord God, we come before you at the close of our night together to thank you for this time that we can look at your word and apply ourselves to understanding it and to understanding the truth behind uh, these historic events. Please help us to take this understanding on board and to um, commit um, ourselves to to your plan and to your your son. We thank you that you gave him for us and that um, he gave himself entirely for us, his whole even his whole life. So please help us to grab hold of that offer that you have offered to us um, with both our hands and to um, commit to uh, this new way of life that you have offered for us. We thank you for watching over us and guiding us to to this truth. Please watch over us in the week ahead and guide our every actions to align with um, your ways and your son's ways. Are we, at this time, we thank you for the temporary blessings that you give us each day. We thank you for the supper that um, has been provided for us and for all the blessings that you give us each day in our lives. So we thank you for this night and for this time through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ's name. Amen.